arrived at the, at the Tabor household. The uh, tree is up, the lights are up. Uh, my wife, I don't know, ever since we've been married, she's been after me to put lights outside the house. And so two years ago, I got one of those laser things. And so I just uh, plug that in. And it just does its thing. It's, oh no. So, I don't know. You, you know what I'm talking about, right? The little thing you plug in, it draws the things on the side of the. Um, actually, a friend of mine, uh, when he first came out, he goes, Make sure that if you have a cat, the, the, the curtains are drawn. He said the first time he put it out there and it was doing lasers all over. And he had a window that was open and was drawing the laser inside the house. He goes, he woke up the next morning, the cat had destroyed everything. But he was exhausted and laying there, worn out, because he'd been chasing the laser all night. Tibbets of wisdom. But it's interesting because, you know, this is the, the most wonderful time of the year, as the old song sings. And, you know, it's a time of rejoicing and praising and all those things going on. And you look at the cards and uh, Hallmark specials. Like I said, the Tabor's Christmas is at our house, so it involves Hallmark movies. And, uh, which is the like, same four actors and everything. And uh, I won't get into that. I'll get myself in trouble. Um, but it's all about the happily ever after. And it is for a lot of people. But Christmas also can be a, a really hard time for many. That idea of a blue Christmas. I think this really devastates a lot of people. And there's a lot of different factors and that's going on. And I remember at one point in my life, um, you guys, you know, you guys know we've we've had it. My wife has had two stillborns. And probably the most devastating thing that we've gone through. And, and I remember sitting down and being at the mall and looking at everyone walking around, and they were all so happy. And I was so angry and hurt. And I'm like, how is it that they can be all happy? Don't they know? And of course, you know, in their own life, they, they have their ups and their, they have their downs. But I was crushed because I was hurting so bad. And I'm like, how can you not hurt too? And especially this time of year, we have a friend whose uh, brother passed away at a young age on Christmas Eve. And so this time of year, she's just like, don't even talk to me. And in that reality, I, I just felt compelled to, to talk about a Christmas hope in the blue Christmas. Matthew chapter 5, Jesus has the Beatitudes. And in verse 4, he says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. You know, the, the stuff our emotions and pretend they're not real um, doesn't really do much. And actually God tells us to come to him. The book of Job tells us is that man is born of woman and is of a few days and full of trouble. And in this life we have ups and we have downs. We have tribulations and we have losses. And God understands that. Becoming a Christian doesn't give us this Pollyannic viewpoint that nothing ever happens you know that nothing, everything's wonderful and birds and rainbows and and all those things but we live in a broken world and it's interesting because you know we, we often you know clean up uh the idea of christmas you know we, we get christmas cards and you know you go out and you try to find the one and they're all silver and gold and always these wonderful scenes and all these things and Actually, that first Christmas, you read the events of that, there's a very real-life struggle within the narrative. Things wasn't just all rosy and hunky-dory. So this morning I want to take a look at, and maybe this is where maybe you're at, 
that in the midst of this Christmas, when everyone else is happy and wonderful and you're kind of hurting on the inside, there's four aspects I want to look at in the, in the original Christmas story. And the first one is the idea of broken dreams. You know, in, in our lives, as we go down and we look, uh, we often start off optimistic. I remember being a young lad, and I wanted to be uh, uh, an astronaut cowboy. I mean, I was going to wrap all these things up, and, and I, was, I had all these hopes and all these dreams, and what I was going to be when I grow up. And now I'm a little bit past my youth. And I look back at my life and some of those things that I had dreamt about and some of the things I thought were going to work out didn't work out that way. I want to take a look at Mary this morning. In Luke chapter 1, the story goes on like this. Is then the angel said to her, talking about Mary, Do not be afraid, Mary. For you have found favor with God, and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and shall name his name Jesus, and he will be great, and will be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. In his kingdom there will be no end. And so the angel arrives and says, look, you're going to be having a child, and what a wonderful child this is going to be, and look at all these hopes that he has, that he's going to be a fulfillment of all these Old Testament prophecies, that in you the Messiah is finally going to come. And I picture young Mary, this young girl, and she looks at the angel and she said, how can this be, since I do not know a man? Whoa, 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 back up a little bit. It's interesting, because I, I didn't realize, you know, because guys are a little bit different. Probably get kick off Facebook for saying that. But guys and girls are different. And I didn't realize this, that, you know, when I was dating my wife, well, she wasn't my wife at that point, but and I was chasing her and trying to pursue her and trying to persuade her that I was the guy. That I didn't realize that. I think we were, we were married, and I found a notebook where she had written in the notebook, Cindy Tabor. You know, she was, she was practicing the last name. And I didn't know this. Uh, I had a few conversations with some girls that a lot of girls will, will spend their, their younger years planning their wedding. You know, who's going to be there and what color is going to be and all that decoration. Guys, we don't do any of that. Right? And basically what happens is they're just looking for a guy they can plug into their dream. I was like, what? So I didn't know there was all this scheme and conspiracy behind it all. Of turning around and being a mother. and All that comes into play. And I'm sure Mary had a lot of those dreams. You know, at this point she had just gotten engaged to Joseph. And I don't know if she was writing Mrs. Mrs. Joseph. I don't, you know, I don't know if she was practicing that or, or what it was going to be like, the wedding ceremony, and who was all going to come, and what food they were going to eat, and you know, then dream about how many kids they were going to have. And but the angel's news to her must have shook her because. How can I have a kid? I, I, I'm not even married yet. And Mary's gene, dreams were put on hold for the will of God. Because word surely would get out that she was pregnant and not married yet. And we it happens very often nowadays, but that was so taboo back then. And the rumors and the whispers. If you guys live in a small town, you know how that is. Right? I mean, word gets around. I mean, even before there was Facebook, word spread. We were one church, and they said there's three forms of communication. There was telephone, television, and tell us, Sally. There's one lady in town. You told her, and word got around even quicker than anything else. 
and the scandal. And here they were righteous, good Jewish, right? She was supposed to be a good Jewish girl. Wait till she's married and do everything right. And yet now the angel said, whoa, 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 all that is out the window. It's interesting because Mary turns around and Luke picks up and says, And then Mary said, Behold, the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. And she submits to it. Right? It would shake her world. She knew people would whisper. She knew there would be rumors. And what about Joseph? How is she going to break the news to him? But Luke picks up an interesting thing in verse 39. He says, Now when Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste to the city of Judah. And this passage goes on that she runs across Elizabeth, who is uh, her cousin who is older. And she's pregnant now with John the Baptist. And talks about the baby leapt in the womb. But it says that Mary went off into the country with haste. Why? Why was why she such a hurry to get it out of town? Because word would get out. And it doesn't matter what she, you know, what's she going to tell people? Well, no, this, is, this is from God. Oh, yeah, right, yeah. So she fled to the safety of the country to stay with Elizabeth. Matthew picks up, he says, Now the birth of Jesus was as followed. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. Now think about that. Joseph knew it wasn't his child. He had a reputation to keep, but he loved Mary. He could have actually had her taken out and stoned. But he loved her, and he wanted to put her away privately, but he was going to break up with her. All of Mary's dreams were dashed. And we have an introduction here. It says, But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. You know, my, my heart just breaks for, for, for Mary. Here, she's been chosen, and blessed are you among women, the scripture talks about. But yet, she had to bear the blunt of all her dreams kind of breaking apart. And over the years, I, I know so many people who feels like their dreams are dashed upon the stones, who get lost in the midst of it all. And Christmas is just one of those holidays where you get together with friends and family and everyone's joyous and it just drives home that maybe your life isn't what you thought it would be. Say, Pastor, this is such an encouraging message. Now, I want to be careful because I don't want to belittle your, 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 your pain. I want to belittle your struggle because it's real. But we do have a hope in Christmas that the Lord Jesus Christ, he came. And his coming brings the fact of who he is and what he is to us. In Romans, we have the promise as if we know that all things work together to good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. It is hard words to hear sometimes because when I'm going through something, I don't want these platitudes. And yet it doesn't take away from the truth of it all. God is working in your life to produce good things. Even in your brokenness. Jesus Christ was familiar with this. Luke, when Jesus Christ was, was facing the cross, 
In the Garden of Gethsemane, he turned around and he said, and he withdrew from them about a stone's throat. He knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if it be your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Then the angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthened him, and being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. You know, in the probably the darkest parts of my life, the struggle that I had in the midst of it all, I came to the realization that how can this bad and how can this struggle, how can all of this work together for good? And I don't, I don't have an answer for you. I just trust God that it is. That Jesus Christ was struggling, facing the cross. The Bible said he, he, he struggled so much with it. it. It hurt him that so much so he wept and he sweat blood. And he said, Father, if there's any other way, stop this. And there wasn't. See, God wants what's good for you and to produce good in your life. And sometimes it's the tragedies, it's the broken dreams in our life that he uses. And if there was any other way for God's will to be accomplished, he would take that. But no. The hope of it all, the struggle you're going through, it's necessary. Because if there was any other way for God's will to be accomplished, he wouldn't. And Jesus came to that point and said, not my will, but your will be done. So in the past, as we go down and we look at these struggles, we turn around and look at our dashed dreams. He says this, it casts all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. The consolation I want to give you is throw your life to the Lord. See, often these things will, will separate us from God, right? My prayer suffers. Uh, I, I don't want to go to church. You know, I, I'm hurt. I'm struggling. I don't want those things. Folks, draw to him. Because you may not feel like he cares, but you know what? He does. Psalm 56, verse 8. I, I really love this verse. This is, you number my wanderings, you put my tears in your bottle, and they not in your book. Every tear that you have shed, God knows. In the loneliness, in the darkness, every tear he gathers up in his bottle. He cares. We look at the idea of broken dreams. Like first Christmas morning, it was filled with so much uncertainty. Luke says this, And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days, days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. Imagine, after all of this, uh, nine months of the scandals and whispers and all this other stuff, finally uh, a census comes up. It's like, oh man, what now? Right? Oh, you know, everyone has to go down and be registered. And so they get up, and I, I envision, it doesn't say this, but I envision Mary on a donkey, and, and I can't imagine how comfortable that trip would have been. See, I was... I, when I was young, I was kind of I was kind of foolish. And my wife was nine months pregnant, and someone told me that if you go on a bumpy road, it will induce labor. So I told the wife, "Hey, let's go for a ride." I didn't tell her what my plan was, but I was eager for this child to come. So I convinced her to get into the car. And uh, up around Ludlow, there is a back road in Ludlow that is known for actually being more pot than holes, right? 
And so we get in the car, and I hit about 60 miles an hour, and I went down that road, and we were bouncing and flying, and she was screaming and hitting. No baby was born, but divorce was close at hand. So I can't imagine riding and arriving in Bethlehem after that long ride and, and come up through and, and go look for a place. And now because typically you would stay with families, but the city was overwhelmed because everyone had come and there was just nowhere for Mary and Joseph to stay. Oh, come on, one more thing. And finally they end up in the stables. Not exactly a place where a mother wants to give birth. They make do, and Jesus is laid in a feed trough in a manger. And we look at the struggle and all that's going on, and maybe you're in your life that you're at a point of so much uncertainty. Everything's in the air. Lord, I'm trying to do what's right, but yet... Why is all this still happening to me? You know, imagine Mary and Joseph say, Look, this is your child, God. Why, why are things just falling into place? Why are things so difficult? And I know people say, will come along and say, Well, no one will give you more than you can handle. You ever had someone say that to you? And you just want to hurt them in Jesus' name? I mean, just... I want to give you a verse. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. It says, For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. You know what? God had poured on Paul more than he could handle. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. But that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. And maybe you're in that situation where, you know what, you feel like this is more than I can bear. I'm not going to belittle that. But I will tell you, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. It's not your strength that will get you through it. It's not a matter of you bucking up. It's not a matter of you pulling yourself up by your root straps. It's not that at all. It's only through the grace of God where his grace is sufficient for all your needs. Because sometimes the uncertainties in our life do bring us to points where there's more than I can bear. But praise God, greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And he goes on. He says, therefore, we do not lose heart, even though our inward man is perishing. You know, the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, I love how he puts that. Right? Just a few chapters before that, he goes, look, it's beyond our strength. We, there is the point unto death, right? It was just too much for us. But he looks back and he says, you know, that was light affliction which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceedingly and eternal weight of glory. And maybe your life is just filled with uncertainty now and you just don't know where to go. You don't know your next step. All I know is the scripture tells you God is working these things. Let me give you a verse. Isaiah 41. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. In these uncertainties and the struggles we go through, the psalmist says this, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because you are with me. You know, I'm a 55-year-old man. I'm rough and I'm tough. But this verse just melts my heart to know 
In, when I am lost, I don't know what to do. God holds my hand. He holds my hand. Well, I am afraid. I will trust in you. And the uncertainty in your life, as you go through it, and oftentimes these things in our lives, we must go through. But I want to encourage you, these things have I spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Maybe this Christmas you found yourself with a handful of hope and dreams. Maybe you found yourself with so much uncertainty in your life. And maybe, maybe this has been a time of loss. Maybe this has been a year of saying goodbye to loved ones. It doesn't have to be this year. It's, it's amazing how how the loss just kind of lingers. I often liken it to the waves on the ocean shore after a storm. You ever been out in the ocean and you see the waves come in and during the storm the wind blows and the waves are just constant and just bombarded and bombarding and bombarding and you feel that way and then time goes by and the waves... They still come, but they get further apart. I often think grief is that way. And when you least suspect it, a wave of, gr- of grief can just come over you. And I think there are some losses that we never always get over. We see this in the Christmas story. It says, then Harry, when he was when he saw that he was deceived by the wise men, right? Remember the wise men came, looked, hey, where's the Messiah? And he said, oh, the scribes looked up. He said, oh, he's in Bethlehem. Well, you go down there, come back and, and give us word, right? Give us word so I, we can go and worship him too. And he had no plan to do that. He saw Jesus as competition and Herod was going to wipe him out. And says, when Herod, when he saw he was deceived by the wise men, was exceedingly angry and sent forth and put to death all the male children who were in Bethlehem and in all its districts, from two years old and under, according to the time which he had determined from the wise men. And when he had fulfilled what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, A voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation, weeping, and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted, because they were no more. Imagine the grief of every mother who had a child. It was taken. Book Revelation gives us a picture of a dragon waiting for the Christ, and see, Satan has come to destroy. And in here, the promise was that Rachel would weep for her children and could not be comforted, and and some of the loss. I don't have words. I I can't make things better. I can't take things away. I don't understand why some of these things happen. I don't know why you've had to say goodbye. But we have a hope. See, Christ changes everything. And Christ came, and in there we have hope. Paul told the Thessalonians, I do not want to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if you believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. That in here, as we look at the struggle that we have, when we face our losses, notice what it says here, we weep as those who, we still weep. It still hurts. I got two babies in heaven. And I know I've said this before. and So I'm saying this more for me because I need that reminder. And I don't have any theological base on that, but I believe that there's a little nursery in heaven that I'll be able to hold my little babies 
Now, I don't want to be stuck as a baby for all eternity, so God can zap them a little, and then after that, bring them back. But I live for that hope of those who have gone on before. Over the last couple of years, my biological father and my stepfather have passed away. We were just out at a funeral for my mom's other husbands just passed away, and we were just out there for that funeral. My father-in-law, many others. I'm starting to get old because I'm starting to know more people in heaven than I do here on earth. And there are some people I, I, I just miss. There's folks in this very congregation that I have fallen in love with that I've had to do their funeral for. Anything I say cannot take that pain away, but yet there's a hope because of Christ. And I look forward to that day of this promise. It says, And God will wipe away every tear from your eye, and there shall be no more death, no sorrow, no crying. There will be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. See, folks, the best thing I can do is give you a hope that there is going to be a time where our tears will be wiped from our eyes. There'll be no more pain, no more goodbyes. I won't have to ever do another funeral again. I will never have to pray for someone who's struggling with cancer, of a broken home, of a deserted child, Folks, if we believe that, let's live for that hope. Let's live for that hope. And I just want to leave you. Because this is the invitation that Christ has given. He says, Come to me, all you who labor are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And maybe you found yourself this Christmas, or maybe many Christmases, has been a blue Christmas. And I can't take that pain away, I can't take away the uncertainty. And I can't give you those that you have lost. All I can tell you is run to Jesus. He says, come to me. All you who labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. My prayer, as you go through this Christmas, just rely on him. Let's pray. Our dearly Father, we thank you for your word. That Lord, in this life, there are struggles. In this life, there are tribulations. In, in life, there, there is hurt. And, and many here are, are even feeling the weight of those things. And, and it's amplified, Lord, because we see the world rejoicing and happy. And, and Lord, we're weighed down. But Lord, the, the hope we have can get us through. The hope of seeing, the hope of guidance, the hope of goodness, all in you, Lord. The hope is in you. Lord, help us to stay close to you. Lord, we ask this in your name. Amen.